I've learned over a period of time there are certain emotional sort of cues when your intentions, your work as a journalist is questioned, it hurts you viscerally and you learn after a while this is stupid, why should I react? We have seen an awakening amongst younger journalists, amongst female journalists saying, look, it's not okay that we get beaten up because of our job. It's not okay that you know our bosses don't look after us and don't care about us. How is India comparing to the rest of the world in terms of journalism freedom? In the reduction, you're a market leader. I think that 50% of the Dutch female journalists uh, get insults online and they get sexist uh, remarks uh, and things like that. Uh, and what we do is when we, whenever one of us receives uh, threats or uh, just their bullying on uh, online and social media, we make screenshots and we share them in our app group and then we have evidence we can go to the police. Uh, so this is very valuable and they just last year heard that they get this funding. So that's very good, I think. I mean, it has made a difference, yes, but I feel like in the long term it will only make a difference if our bosses are willing to listen to us. Reporters who are in danger because of their identity is not an easy question to answer. We have to ask ourselves, as a country, is this the country we are designing where on the basis of identity, your possibility of journalism is being restricted. But that's a question that cannot be answered at the institution level. We can only look at the question of safety and take decisions there. Can you imagine an Indian newsroom where the owner can be pushed to do things that the owner does not want to do? We don't have an ecosystem where that is possible. None of these things can be implemented in the vast majority of mainstream news media in this country. Yes, some of our small digital portals, some some of us who will remain aware of it may do some things, but the rest of it, what you're talking about, would require a transformation in the entire Indian news ownership ecosystem before it even begins to happen. Thank you everyone for coming to this session. Journalists facing threats is not new, um, whether it's defamation, civil or criminal cases against different laws like UAPA, sedition, um, threats, intimidation, most, and of course the online abuse and threats online, which is, I think, a new trend in the last few years. So what? how do journalists deal with it? How do organizations look at it? Are we doing enough? What more can we do? These are things that we'll discuss today. I'll start with you, Fatima. Um, your work recently, uh, and you're also ta you're targeted for your work, for the kind of stories that you do, and for the fact that you're a woman, and a Muslim who's been reporting uh, from many of these uh, uh, from many of these places, uh, which are safe, uh, unsafe for reporters to go, and you have been doing these controversial stories. Uh, how has your experience been, and has the harassment really increased in the last few years? Right. Thank you, Nanya. Um, you know, I began my career as a journalist at a time when. Uh, the troll factory and the IT cell, etc., had already been discussed about. And I mean, it was all about all in the open. So I wasn't really in for a surprise. I knew what I was uh, signing up for. Um, I think what has happened in the last couple of years, at least in the last year, what I've noticed is that a lot of what I would face uh, online, the threats that I would face online, in my head, I would compartmentalize it very neatly that, OK, this is something that I face online. These are just trolls, IT cell, et cetera. But that's not how it works. And uh, very recently, in fact, just a couple of months ago, I did this story on uh, the men who were accused of shooting at a member of parliament, Asaduddin Uwesi. So I went to um, meet them in their village, in their in home. In Uttar Pradesh. In Uttar Pradesh. While on my way, they told me, you know, Mohammedan is not allowed in this And I said, too late, I've committed, <laughs> I'm all in, uh, so I just need to go for it. So I went, I met them, I entered this place, and there is this, I mean, it's this, it's a tiny room, but it's packed to the rafters with uh, the accused men supporters. They've just gotten out on bail. They're being celebrated, they're being garlanded. I walk in and, um, so a day before that, there was a bigger celebration. And part of that celebration was uh, Ram Bhag Gopal, who was accused in the Jamia shooting, uh, who's also since then did multiple crimes, been arrested multiple times, and is very active on social media. Uh, and I'd done a story on how these men, after coming out from jail, on bail, they've been welcomed and garlanded, including by Ram Bhag Gopal. And I'd done that story. and. Uh, Thankfully, I didn't see it then. Later, a week later, I went to his profile and I saw that he had screenshotted my story and said something very nasty about me. And many of 
his supporters in the comment section had written it too. And when I went in, um, I was just thinking, oh God, I hope he's not here. Because the thing is, a lot of times I go to rural Uttar Pradesh, etc., to do a lot of these stories on right wing members. But today, increasingly, uh, I mean, we know the right wing is is the are the first people who have kind of just been empowered by this WhatsApp and social media boom. So all of them are super active. All of them, I feel, know us, track us. So I went in and in my head, I'm just thinking, oh God, if someone here recognizes me, I'm done. And throughout that two and a half hours in that man's house, I didn't take off my mask. They were uh, distributing mithai and ghevar and this, that on the occasion of this man accused of shooting at someone coming out um, and I couldn't take off my mask and I'm just thinking, no, 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 it's okay. I need to keep my uh, calm and get out of there. Uh, and, you know, moments like these, they kind of make you realize that, okay, what we, what I have like, I have told myself that, you know, it's just social media abuse, it's slander, it's going to go away, it's, it doesn't impact my work. It does. Uh, very quickly, I do want to say this, right, because you said as a Muslim reporter, I know many Muslim journalists and otherwise who were part of this... Um, yeah, bully by and Sully deals where, for those who don't know, uh, people who, uh, you know, are active on social media would know that uh, there was this list circulated twice last year, actually, uh, where uh, Muslim women, journalists, activists, poets, etc., uh, they were put on a list and auctioned online. And I remember, in fact, many uh, journalists, many liberals uh, at the time said, oh, you know, it's just online auctioning. It's not like you're really being sold. Thank God. Um, uh, small mercies. So anyway, so and I remember a few days after that, I, I even then, you know, my instinct is, you know what, I'm a ground reporter. This doesn't affect me or I don't want it to affect me. I'll go on the field and I'll block it all out. I remember two days after that, I went to UP because uh, Uttar Pradesh elections were around the corner. And this man walked up to me and he said, oh, aap to wo hai na? Um, and immediately I just flinched because in my head I thought, OK, what if he's one of the guys who's either, you know, circulated that or seen that list. Uh, but it turned out that he was just someone, he was an admirer of like our work that we'd been doing. And I, you know, I said, okay, thank you. And I was telling it to the story to a friend. And that's when he said, you know, that this is not, not a normal reaction. You know, any other journalist would be happy on being recognized. But my first instinct was, oh God, he's someone. And you said to. you compartmentalize this in your head. How, how do you do that? I try to. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the failings of that effort. That's that's what I'm tra trying to talk mm. about that, you know. I will say this though, the one advantage I'll say or respite of being someone who gets the opportunity of hitting the field is that I can, you know, when I'm there, I can switch all of this off. I can tell myself that at this point of time, I'm entering someone's home. And in that, you know, even when I go to meet this man who's accused of shooting at someone or during the UP elections, we did a full series called Everyday Communalism, where I'm going and meeting Bajrang Dal, BHP, etc. and how they go about their vigil vigilantism. And even then, my endeavor is never to, you know, I'm going to come out of this having demonized this person. It's to just go and sit and have a conversation and hopefully come out with a meaningful story. Um, so that allows you some space away from this uh, noise of social media, which can be too overwhelming at times, which I'd say is I'm lucky that way. People who, you know, say like a Zubair or someone who are constantly, whose work involves them and revolves around social media and uh, tracking hate there for them I don't think this is an option um, so in that sense I, I try to look at this as a silver lining so this session can get very uh, heavy therefore I think uh, uh, we'll have to look at solutions also but before that when the introductions were made when Hartosh's uh, introduction was read out you must have guessed considering all the organizations that he worked with that in this stage he would have the most uh, cases against him because Caravan, Open Magazine, Tehelka. So um, everyone says that things have gotten worse in India for journalists. Would you agree with that? Would you agree with that assessment? And uh, would you also say that the problem now is bigger because there is a decline in institutions? For example, um, whether it's government departments like income tax, etc., which are also used now to intimidate journalists. Well, clearly the problem is far worse. Uh, I think the ambassador referred to the need of journalism in open societies. We are today working in a closing society. And that closing is political and institutional. And it is very different from, we've done stories, I mean, I keep bringing up the comparison. I was with Open, we did the Radia tapes. Uh, okay, so the media, the mainstream media killed the story, but social media picked it up, it spread all through. Today, when you go to Loya or any other story about, the first thing that is done is, not address the story, but address us. You have 
9 p.m. news where the intentions of the journalists or caravan or individually would be put up for examination. Most of that examination is through our social media posts. Look at these guys, they are anti-Hindu, this is that. So you're saying the intimidation is also from the media now, the to media, the media? The media has been weaponized. The media is, the mainstream media is used to attack anything that goes against the government. That is part of the trolling. Uh, the government itself is a troll. We've got cases filed against the caravan. Uh, my colleague, editor, uh, Vinod, the owners, for a tweet on the farmer's agitation from the site, which was a reporting tweet. Mm -hmm. So you can get that. Uh, some of our journalists facing trouble in Kashmir. The police, when they're investigating them, are angered by our continuous tweeting of stories that we are putting out. So yes. Institutionally, it's got far worse. Uh, this has been weaponized because we no longer have a public. Uh, the whole idea of journalism was based on a public that will respond to our journalism and then ask questions of the government. What, what is happening today is that people are asking questions of us. Why are these people doing these stories? Why, what is their intention? What You're are they looking for? You are anti-national, of course, is part of it. And I mean, I still have the advantage of being from a comparatively favored minority, but I realize how soon it changes. At the time of the farmer's agitation, I am suddenly a Khalistani. And you know, I've done this for a long time. I've developed a very thick skin. I don't block anybody, but I've learned over a period of time, there are certain emotional sort of cues. First of all, when your intentions, your work as a journalist is questioned, it hurts you viscerally. And you learn after a while, this is stupid. Why should I react to it? Second is when you suddenly see terms like anti-national or Khalistani. One is that you've stood against these ideas all your life and suddenly you're being blamed for it. And then the third is, I mean, and none of this is comparable to anything that somebody like Fatima would go through, is personal threats that will come through. And in this case, it'll be from both the Hindutva. And in my case, this is a problem that most people don't have to deal with, that there is a Sikh radical diaspora, which is very, very vicious in terms of any criticism of Sikh radicalism, et cetera. So all these issues put together make it very difficult. But I think I've had enough practice of dealing with it. I see this institutionally with our other reporters in the organization, how targeted this can be. And I think finally, and I think this problem becomes bigger for freelancers that institutionally, obviously the caravan Twitter handle can't step in and take sides, but certainly some of us within the organization who have the numbers, I feel it is an obligation for us to step in and actually defend or counter some of that is happening. Maybe try and take the flack on us because we are more used to it. But in the current climate, really there is no larger choice than to, well, <laughs> accept that this is going to happen, recognize it, try and ensure it doesn't get to you emotionally. And the third is maybe if it gets to the stage where the physical threats are dangerous, that you ask for action, though the institutions are not going to respond, you know that. Hmm. Colin, you have studied um, risk assessment and uh, threats that journalists face across the globe. Uh, how do you look at what's happening in India now? Um, what is your assessment of that? So just before I start, I should say there was a crucial line missing in my bio when I was introduced. Uh, the reason why I've been asked to talk is I represent the Committee to Protect Journalists, who supports a number of journalists in India and a number of news institutions for many years now. Uh, and in the last few years, we have seen an increase in the cases of assistance required for journalists under threat from digital intrusion, uh, from physical assault, uh, from mental health abuse, or uh, mental health suffering, I should say. And I've just spent the last week traveling across India from Chennai to Assam, uh, meeting local journalists in local newsrooms, uh, hearing about their problems and trying to share some of the lessons that we have from the international scene. Uh, because we know that local journalists are on the front line. You know, this is the journalists in Chennai and Delhi and uh, Mumbai, uh, they get the headlines. It's the local journalists in the small newsrooms around India who are on the, getting the brunt of the abuse. But your question was, how is India comparing to the rest of the world? Um, I would say, unfortunately, India is actually a market leader. It's a market leader in something that you don't want to be leading in. In terms of online harassment and abuse and digital intrusion, we look at what happens in India, the crucible of India, and we see what happens in terms of abuse is replicated in other parts of the world uh, a few months later. And so, uh, things like Bulibai, 
you know, we are expecting that to happen in other parts of the world. Because uh, the technology is developed here and then exported. You're great at de developing technology, and then sadly, this is an area that you're doing very well in. Wow. <laughs> so we, for us, India is a crucial uh, environment. It's, you know, it's obviously a very vibrant uh, area where there's a his history of freedom of expression, and that freedom of expression is diminishing uh, by the day, and we are increasingly worried about that. And what we try and do is help journalists who are with practical advice, who are dealing with these threats. So, you know, all, every day we're w working with journalists who are saying, I'm being abused, how do I mentally deal with that? We're supporting them with that. Uh, we're going into newsrooms to say, um, you know, one of the things that I'm here to do is, as Hatusha said, you know, Indian journalists for a long time have had a very thick skin. And they have said, you know, all this safety stuff, it's, we know how to handle it. Uh, in fact, many times journalists have said to me, look, the first time you get beaten up at a protest, it's like a rite of passage. That's just what you have to do if you're an Indian journalist. Uh, but in the last few years, particularly because of the pandemic, we have seen an awakening amongst younger journalists, amongst female journalists saying, look, it's not okay that we get beaten up because of our job. It's not okay that you know, our bosses don't look after us and don't care about us. Um, and it's just not okay that the environment we live in is such a hostile one. So how is India comparing to the rest of the world in terms of journalism freedom? In the reduction, you're a market leader. Well, that's perhaps the headline from the session. Bram is from Netherlands. I was speaking to him before we came for the session. And he was telling me that in Netherlands, there, there, are, there is a foundation which actually helps journalists with legal uh, help. Or, and journalists are actually at par with civil servants. So if a journalist has a police complaint, the police have to take you very seriously. As a, if a civil servant gives complaint, it's the same. So I was telling him that that's the place I would want to shift to. So Bram, like Hartosh, Hartosh said, the government is a troll here. Is your government a troll? Or tell us what happens in Netherlands. Most of the time, no. The government is very helpful for investigative journalists. Uh, <laughs> as, <laughs> and yeah, as, as I spoke, uh, I was, uh, the embassy, embassy uh, made it possible for me to visit a couple of newsrooms here in India. And uh, when I tell them their story, they all have the same reaction. It's uh, completely unthinkable, probably in India, that the government would actually uh, pay uh, for critical journalism against the, the, the same government. So, um, but that having said, it's not always like that. And it's especially also, as, as Colin uh, uh, said, um, on a local level, these are the, the, the front soldiers of journalism. Uh, because on a local level, we also see that um, journalists tend to uh, be less critical. They, they uh, are with uh, few people. So they have to fill the columns uh, of one local newspaper with just uh, two or, or three reporters uh, every day. Um, and when they get critical, yeah, they know they will hear it back immediately. Also from municipality government, I think. So uh, that is something that we see uh, as a collective of freelance uh, investigative journalists that I founded with a colleague of mine. Um, we, we try to work together with these local uh, newspapers. Um, but, but these journalists sometimes, they, yeah, they, they are self-censoring themselves um, just by not writing too critical about some some subjects, and it also has to do with the with the threats that they receive if they do uh, sometimes. Uh, and it's not that it's threats like we will come and beat you up, but it's threats for them like uh, if you don't write that, then next week you won't have an interview, and that's also for them a problem because they have to fill their newspapers. So um, these threats are not always very heavy. Uh, especially in the Netherlands, it's still one of the best countries in the world, I think, to be a journalist. Um, but but we see that it's a problem. And also online, what what, you know, what we now do is when these local uh, newspapers won't work with us, we try to publish our investigations, our critical investigations, uh, through social media, and you can get a great audience uh, in that way. But also you can get all the trash, uh, and that's something, uh, yeah, worldwide phenomenon, uh, probably, that uh, everyone can just uh, comfortably from his own Twitter bubble send all the dirt that they want uh, to the, the journalists that do the work. So, um, and in the Netherlands, uh, I think there was uh, research was done that especially for my female colleagues, it's a problem. 
I think that 50% of the Dutch female journalists uh, get insults online and they get sexist uh, remarks uh, and things like that. Um, so what we do as a collective, and I think that's also an advice for um, uh, freelance journalists, because for them, yeah, they are working on their own, on, on the shelves, uh, self-employed. Um, yeah, form a group and try to, uh, to get together, work as a collective. Uh, and what we do is when we, whenever one of us receives uh, threats or uh, just their bullying on, uh, online on social media, we make screenshots and we share them in our app group and then we have evidence we can go to the police. And as you mentioned, there is in the Netherlands this uh, institution, it's a foundation, it's called uh, Persveilig, uh, Safe Press. And they're also doing this uh, mental health uh, um, uh, assistance uh, for journalists. Uh, they do training uh, how to uh, be safe online and offline. Uh, so this is very valuable. And they just last year heard that they get this funding. So that's very good, I think. Hmm. And it's a model that, yeah. So we have 15 minutes more and we have to go to the audience too. Fatima, my question to you is, um, Colin was mentioning that there is a change now. Young journalists are saying that you know, it, it's not uh, it's not okay if people abuse me. It's not okay if organizations don't take things seriously. Has that made a difference? And how do you think organizations should um, tackle this issue? How can they support journalists and also freelance journalists? Yeah. I mean, it has made a difference, yes. But I feel like in the long term, it will only make a difference if our bosses are willing to listen to us. You know, I mean, it doesn't matter how socially awakened I am about these issues and how much I want to do if I can't go to my editor's office and have an honest conversation about the day I've just had, you know, and I feel like a lot of times that's, there is that resistance that young, young journalists feel um, coming their way. And I mean, I feel that increasingly, I hope uh, that that changes. I know the organization I am presently employed with, the Quint, I know that I'm extremely lucky to have uh, bosses who are always willing to listen to me and if I come back and I say no we didn't do this right or I needed this support they will make amends you know and I feel in that sense I know that every digital organization today that is trying to do some independent journalism of course it's resource crunched right so even things like a riot gear when you go and cover the 2020 uh, Northeast Delhi riots you know I mean we, we won't have those because there is a serious resource crunch uh, but I feel like at least in my experience, I feel like intent makes up for a lot of that. Uh, so if the intent is there, if you really want to protect your journalists, you will you will be careful about that. I, I'll, I'll quickly just um, you know go back to the story that I just mentioned. The person who was going with me, the camera person who was going with me, was also a Muslim, a Muslim guy. Uh, he's a Kashmiri, in fact. And it just so happened that on that day we didn't have any other camera person, and we were going and. Uh, in my head, I just like, you know, I'm not getting good feeling about this. I, I just know what they can do if they find out who we are, etc. I know the lens they can go to. Um, and then, you know, a, a, a Hindu camera person was assigned to me and thankfully we were able to go. Um, and it's not like, you know, their first choice, so they're not stupid, it's not their first choice, so let's send these two Muslims in the hub of like terrorism. But they, they, uh, they kind of, there was a there was a resource crunch. We only have two camera persons. One is a Muslim guy, one is a Hindu guy. And in that in that on that particular day, that guy was missing. But finally, you know, we were like, okay, no, you know, we need Shiv to be there. And thank God for that, uh, because I honestly don't know if we would have come out alive, or I would be sitting here if if that wouldn't have happened. I mean, little things like that. You know, I would have wanted a because I know myself. I know my reporter instinct. I'd be like, you know what? Screw it. I'll manage. We'll figure it out. We'll wing it when we are there. But I think an editor needs to hold you back um, and there needs to be some restraint that needs to come in from them and say, you know what, Fatima, you aren't prioritizing your safety right now, but I need to do that. Um, you know, I will not send you to a Maha Panchayat where Yati Singhanand is sitting and talking about how Muslims should be killed. Why were Muslim journalists went to uh, cover that? You know, it's something that we need to ask ourselves. And I'm saying that because as a Muslim journalist, I would be as a journalist, I'd be so keen on going and covering that story, but maybe I'd want an editor to tell me, you know what, Fatima, maybe it's not in your best interest to go and cover that. So little things like that, I think organizationally need to change that. I think CPJ, what they're doing is incredible work, but I think more than like 
individually mentoring journalists or reaching out to them. I think organizations and their editors, especially in some organizations, the editors are just so old school. Uh, they're so bureaucratic in their way of functioning. The idea of having a thick skin is just um, glorified and romanticized so much that work through it all, you know, work. And I've, I've internalized that too. And, you know, it's, you all have to unlearn that. Yeah, I mean, I did uh, at one point glorify thick skin, but then I realized I myself don't have it, especially when I was exposed to online abuse. I want to take that question to you. Are editors glorifying uh, thick skin and uh, are newsrooms doing enough? Do we, do we understand the problems of the journalists that we send out on the ground, uh, of their identity, of who they are and what is the kind of trouble they'll face? Sure. So there are a range of questions. I use the term thick skin and I'll go back to it simply as an observation that from the time I started journalism to where I am now, I have a thicker skin. That is a fact of life. It can't be changed. All of us will go through that process because there is no larger environment in which we can push back. Institutionally, what can we do? Mm. One is that institutions have to be responsible for every story done by the institution. That is, you have to stand up and defend that, whether it is on social media, whether it is legally or otherwise, that includes freelancers working for you. Second is you have to reach out where you can and try and get a response. The third is you have to hear out reporters and see the kind of problems that are being faced. The question that Fatima has raised of reporters who are in danger because of their identity is not an easy question to answer. We will always intervene on the sides of safety and prevent a reporter from going there some point or the other, reporters have raised the question of where is my choice of the kind of stories I want to report. Much of Uttar Pradesh during election period is a place where the risks are already reaching a point where I would not want to send a reporter in and most of the time we don't. We have to ask ourselves as a country, is this the country we are designing where on the basis of identity, your possibility of journalism is being restricted. But that's a question that cannot be answered at the institutional level. We can only look at the question of safety and take decisions there. The larger problem is that there is no environment from which to push back apart from what we can do within the institutions. Uh, the fact is that social media organizations behave differently in India than they do elsewhere the kind of action that should follow, that would definitely follow in the Netherlands if somebody said something about uh, a journalist will not follow here. The kind of pressures that they will succumb to from the government is different. The courts, the police, almost everything is aligned against us. That is the environment we are working under. And it is in that environment we must make choices of who can report what and to what extent. Mm. And at the end of it, that there will be a blowback is the truth. Should it be there? Is it something that is reprehensible? Yes. Is it something we want? No. Uh, is there an easy solution where I can say, yeah, this will prevent it? No. At the end of it, do we become worse in terms of human beings is getting hardened? Unfortunately, it is happening to a lot of us. Mm -hmm. And it is a difficult place to be. So uh, I, I don't report from Delhi, Kashmir, or Uttar Pradesh, thankfully. Uh, but I do report from the south of India. I can just share quickly an example. The Shabrimala temple when it was opened for women, when women could go. I could not send women reporters because they were getting beaten up. Just because they were women reporters, people thought that they are going to the temple. I could not send Christian or Muslim reporters, obviously. And I found it very difficult because I only had women reporters or I had a Christian man and a Muslim man. Finally, the Muslim man, man had a name which... Um, he had two names, so one of it sounded Hindu. So I told him, you go there and say this as your name. Don't say your second name. I mean, that's the call I had to take. Uh, before, we'll just go to two or three audience questions. Colin, are Indian newsrooms taking uh, mental health and how it impacts journalists seriously? Because of all these threats. I think some newsrooms and some editors are very cognizant of the fact that institutionally safety is not built into their systems. And I won't say they're changing, but they're thinking about changing. Hmm. Um, but look, I come from a sort of mature safety system in Western media. But when we say mature, it's like 20 years old. It's not that old. 
you know, 20 years ago, the reason why the BBC set up a safety team, which I was part of, was because we lost someone in the field. And his editor didn't even know he was in the field when he died. Right? And he went to the Balkans war and he was killed and the editor woke up and the first thing he heard on the news was this journalist has been killed. And he said, why is that journalist there? So, you know, that's why we set up these safety, we are, why we institutionalize safety in newsrooms. And as part of that, we institutionalized mental health. But that came much later. It's only in the last 10 years we've been talking about mental health in, in the media. And it's still not, we don't have like a solid gold model. You know, Indian editors, Indian owners of newspapers needs, need to think, are we pr pri prioritizing the well-being of our staff? Hmm. And you need a thick skin to be a journalist. You need to take risks. That's how good journalism is made, right? But are you doing everything to protect those people who are undertaking that, that journalism? Are you looking after them after they come back from work? Uh, have you got a, um, a plan in place? So if they lose a leg, if they lose an eye, do they know what compensation they're going to get? Right? Will it support them hmm. afterwards? These are questions that I think institutionally owners need to be asking of their editors and editors need to be asking of their owners. And I don't, I personally, I don't know if that's happening. Okay, so we'll quickly take two questions. Yes, please. Hello, everyone. Myself, Meher. So my question is like in Indian family systems, we have this uh, concept of a traditional patriarch or a authority that controls the house, that controls the family. So this is directed to all panelists. Do you believe that state, Indian state especially, has been somehow able to exploit this sentiment present in common masses that we are a benevolent authority. We have to take rough and tough decisions to keep a house in order. And any type of dissident, any kind of dissident is actually threat to this uh, order, actually threat to this, uh, actually is a nuisance. So this sentiment present in masses is the reason why the dissidents are not yeah. waived that kindly in this has, has the government been successful in painting dissent as something which is unwarranted, unsafe? I, obviously, I mean, it is very, very clear. And yeah, that is part of the model. But that is exactly why we were a constitutional democracy. I use the term were because we may be a democracy where we have the vote, but we are not a constitutional democracy. Our institutions that were meant to safeguard against exactly this patriarchal authority that the state would force down our throat have all succumbed. And in that, you can include every institution that counts, whether that amounts to contempt or not. Yes, that is true. And so in that sense, any safeguard that could exist no longer exists. This is the environment. Uh, questions? Yes. My name is Ahmed, and uh, I study law from Delhi University. My question is, how do we differentiate between a certain action, which is uh, intimidation of a journalist, or it is uh, uh, whether a fair legal action, which is needed by, uh, by law agencies? How do you differentiate? In intimidation is intimidation. I mean, fair use, you can go and file defamation, but yes. Look, uh, I think we all know the distinction. Unfortunately, we are burdened by a series of laws which have never been reformed, which under certain circumstances can always be invoked for whatever guise, and there will be institutions that will uphold it, but we know that intimidation, anything that is being used to silence a reporter, a journalist doing work that is done according to journalistic norms is intimidation, whatever law is invoked against it. Uh, yes, I'll come. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Naveen, and uh, so I work as a freelance photo journalist, and there's this uh, observation that I made. One time I was in Janta Mandar, which is not a hostile place at all, and there was a protest going on, and there was this newly appointed photo journalist for Reuters, and uh, they were not uh, covering it, someone else was covering it, and I was, and asked why, and she was like, because I've not gone through something called HEFAT training, hostile environment first state training. I was like, what? Did something like this exists? And I had never heard about it. Then another example, I was covering a uh, power protest. And there was uh, uh, these gas being used, lati charge and stone pelting. And out of 50 odd journalists, only two or three had actually had uh, helmets or all the gear that Fatima is talking about that we need. So my question is, is it every time we talk about it, we say there's a resource crunch. Is it that resource heavy to buy a decathlon helmet and 
and a gas mask uh, yeah. for so journalists. Call it, uh, I'll just go because I have to yeah. wrap. The, the question is, is it actually resource crunch or is it the intent is not there systematically? Or we don't take it very seriously that we need to train our journalists on how to handle situations. Yeah, so, I mean, hostile environment training is something that's valued by Western news organizations. Not all of them, some of them. And one of the things they've introduced in order to increase the caliber of journalists around the world is they've said they, many organizations say we cannot commission news or freelancers in, say, India who have not had the same level of training as we have got. Now, most Indian journalists don't have that training. But what it means is that news organizations have to go out and give that training to the staff. And you know, I, I work with news organizations in Ukraine, for example. And right now, there are many of them who are training all their local Ukrainian staff. There are BBC, Thomson Reuters, they come here and they train all their local staff and they train their fixers. We want Indian newsrooms to start doing that, okay? Um, but going back to the resource crunch, yes, some of this equipment is expensive, without a doubt. But you're right. How much is a decathlon bike helmet at a protest, which could save your life, right? And more importantly, risk assessment costs nothing, right? Taking the time to say, what are the risks? Should we send a Muslim on a story? Consulting that journalist, that's free, right? No one charges for that. So why, why is that not part of the normal processes? And in Western newsrooms, and I'm not saying they're right, okay? Let's not just say this is a Western thing. But the, one of the values is that we value our staff, we value our freelancers, we value their lives. Now, Indians might say we don't, that's not a, a value that we share. Yeah, because but we, I think it would be a shame if they It's like said, a fight through our lives, right? So, <laughs> yes. Hi, I'm uh, Shudipto. I think an extension of the same uh, paradigm of what newsrooms or editors or organizations, promoters included, uh, do they do anything differently in the, the world that Colin and uh, uh, Netherlands journalism looks like, where there is insurance or special incentives or hardship or uh, any of those things which, which complement hard work put in on the field or challenges taken? Uh, yeah, so big news organizations have insurance. Um, it's a requirement for, say, like if you're doing a documentary for the BBC and you're a freelancer, you need to have insurance. It's, they, won't, they won't commission without it. Um, it's very costly. Uh, I was just involved in a conversation online where uh, freelancers were saying we can't afford the 6,000 pounds required every month by the insurance company in Ukraine. How are we going to pay for that? Um, so in some places, it's expensive. In India, it's not that expensive. Uh, but you know, what you're talking about is institutional safety. We have structures in place that, gar not guarantee, but they're there to minimize the risk that we expose our staff to. And if our managers do not live up to those expectations, they don't have jobs for very long. So, you know, that has become ingrained in our, in our news networks, and we think it's a good thing. You know, the, I, I'm, I don't want to push something on India that maybe India doesn't think is a good thing, but we think it's a good thing. I think that also in the, in the Netherlands, it's the same. Uh, the big news organizations all have these insurances, and it's, 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 it's good. Uh, however, still, for freelance journalists, there's work to do, and there are still freelance journalists Sometimes because they don't know what they are starting or that what they're going to do, uh, just heading for a war uh, zone and um, yeah, they sh they should be protected better maybe. Uh, but there's there's organizations that help for it. Many of the things that I've heard Colin say, not because the intentions are wrong, because I worked with eight or ten different organizations. Let us understand the news ownership ecosystem in this country before we start pushing ideas that actually, unfortunately, are in La La Land. They are never going to happen in this country, not because we don't want them to happen, not because we are not cognizant of this. 
you can you imagine an indian newsroom where the owner can be pushed to do things that the owner does not want to do we don't have an ecosystem where that is possible none of these things can be implemented in the vast majority of mainstream news media in this country yes some of us small digital portals some of us who will remain aware of it may do some things but the rest of it what you are talking about to require a transformation in the entire indian news ownership ecosystem before it even begins to happen so for all the students who are here i guess most of your students it, this is a very depressing discussion but things are not that depressing i i'm sure everyone on this stage would agree that there is no other job that we would do so happily so passionately therefore being a journalist is tough but it is really a job that all of us love and in the past few years we are all banding together more especially the digital sites so perhaps there's no way to rescue our mainstream media but the independent publications are growing in size in number and they are standing together they are standing against a lot of things so don't go back from this uh, auditorium thinking i don't want to be a journalist maybe i'll go into pr things are not that bad thank you very much thank you everyone